Welcome to the podcast. We do recover with Jared Miller, your host. And I'm Dr. Terry Sellers, your co-host. This is a podcast about recovery from addiction. We want to talk about what successful recovery can look like. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. Mic check, check, check. We are rocking and rolling. (laughs) Welcome to We Do Recover with Jared Miller. All right, episode 54 is going down. I have the amazing Jen Jones here with us. Hello. Good afternoon, Jen. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. How are you? I am also fantastic. Excited for this episode. So we're going to get uh, Jen Jones has come on. She's going to talk us through steps one through three, kind of how they, they showed up in her life. She's also going to do a deep dive into step four in, in the second part of this thing. So before that, though, episode 54 is brought to you by Steps Recovery Centers, where addiction ends and healing begins. If you or a loved one need help, give them a call. Call them at 801 801- Eight zero zero eight one four two. All right. Well, we start off with new and goods. What is new and good in your life, Jen? Well, um, I just started a new job, which is good. That Does is. Does that count? That, hey, that's new and good. There you go. One and done. Fantastic. So for those of you that don't know Jen Jones, she's an amazing case manager. She does a fantastic job. Probably one of the best in all of Southern Utah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I mean it. You do you do great work. So, So how's the new job coming? It's good. Yeah. yeah. I think it's new and good, as I stated <laughs> earlier. Um, yeah, I think it's it's good. It's a, um, a new program, which is fun, and uh, working through some of the things and, and getting to do something different, which is amazing. That's awesome. You can give them a little shout-out if you want. A little shout-out to Hope Rising Recovery and Detox. Yeah, we love all of them down here. Be a team player. That's Absolutely. The, yeah, those guys those guys are awesome. Love Ty and, and, and all the people on your crew, so... Good deal. Yeah. Well, sweet. That is a, an awesome new and good. Yeah. So uh, you also got some new swag. I, should, do. I guess we do our our next sponsorship mention. I don't, you'll have to do it, but yeah. Uh, you, <laughs> go ahead. Take it. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sweet. So we got a new sponsor. Recovery Strong has come on. And listen, guys, join the recovery movement by representing your recovery out loud. Go to recoverystrong.com. If you click on their little shop gear tab. You can pick out whatever you want. They got some cool stuff. Be a part of the recovery movement, right? Be proud that you're in recovery. Like, we got to overcome the stigma. Check this out. If after you pick out whatever you want, doesn't matter what it is, we're not doing any featured items. It's all for game. Just use the promo code WE DO RECOVER in all caps. WE DO RECOVER, no spaces. When you check out, it saves you 15% when you check out. Recovery Strong is all about strengthening, sorry, fighting addiction and strengthening recovery. The thing that I love about Recovery Strong is, so you remember when we did like a fundraiser for the Sobriety Foundation. Mm -hmm. So when I called Jared Sean, I talked to him. I kind of told him like my vision of like, hey man, I love your guys' stuff. I love what you guys are doing. I love raising money either for events for the community to be able to uh, give some money to sober living. And he was like, let's do it. So a portion of every, a portion of every apparel that is sold, t-shirt, sweater, shirt, uh, hoodie, it all, a portion of it goes in a fund and then we're going to save up and we're going to be able to donate that to either Sober Livings or do a community event, something cool, something to, to kind of help out. And again, it's all kind of overcoming the stigma of addiction. So that's awesome. Love those guys. Yeah, I love those guys. So let's get Sean Denneman's new and good now that we got mine and yours, Jen. Mine's okay. Nothing special. You're fired, It's just Sean. an okay job. Okay day. Nothing special. We no. walked in and you whoa, were. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You have no idea the day and week I've had. You catch me on a three minute break. And what I, did we see, oh. Jen? What did we see when we walked in? I, I saw him taking a break with some pizza and Marvel. The good watching life. cartoons. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice. I've set up for the marathon today. I got to do the marathon tonight and tomorrow. I'm doing sound. I'm announcing all the names of people coming across the finish. Are you running the marathon? No, but you I'll be like, there volunteering oh, to help I out. You're going to run or something? I don't run, dude. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I get to announce all six, seven thousand names coming through the finish line for the half marathon, which is new, and then the marathon, which happens every year. All right. So we're gonna have a history lesson real fast. Do you know who started? Not a clue. Do you know who Don't started even ask. the St. George Marathon? I have no idea. A somebody guy, somebody who was like running away from their wife. I don't know. He may have been. He may have been. His name was Sherman Miller, and he was my uncle. Really? Yeah. No he, way. Way. And you've never run the marathon. And, and, and I've never run the marathon. Wow, he would be disappointed <laughs> in you. Yeah, he was working for the city at the time, and he was like, 
telling his coworkers, like, we need a community event, something to get St. George on the map. Let's do a, a marathon. And people are like, are you nuts? Nobody will ever run a marathon in St. George. It's way too hot. And now it's a pre-qualifier for the Boston Marathon. It's a huge deal. So kind of cool. It's like my 10th year announcing on it. So, Yeah, thanks, Uncle Sherman. Kind of uh, sweet. I thought you were going to say thank you, Sean. But okay, oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank thanks, you, Sean. Uncle, thank thanks, you, Uncle Sean. Sherman, too. There yeah, you go. Yeah, Jen's yeah. got you. Yeah. But, but the good part is after that, I'm going to take the car and the truck and the wife. We're going to drive up to Kolob and look at the uh, beautiful leaves changing. And yeah, then drive right. up to Cedar the back way and just enjoy a nice part of the country with nobody around. Cross our fingers. That's awesome. That's way awesome, man. I'm I'm jealous. Well, sweet. So, thank you guys for checking in. I guess let's get rocking and rolling. So, Jen Jones, this is a podcast about the recovery movement, right, from addiction. So, talk to me. Are you a person in long-term recovery? I am. Fantastic. You want to kind of paint us a picture of what that looked like? How long you been in long-term recovery? Um. Okay. So, <clears throat> I've been in recovery for six years and some change. Um, I will have seven years in November. Congratulations. It's yeah. right around the corner. Yeah. It's wild. Awesome. I can, it's felt like the shortest and longest seven years of my life. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's been crazy. It's crazy to even think about it. Every time I get closer to another date, I'm, I just, it's mind blowing to me. What so, part of it is mind blowing to you? Like what? Um, <clears throat> well, the fact that I'm alive, for one, I think that that <laughs> it, it hits me often. The fact that I'm not in federal prison or um, I, the fact that I didn't spend a lot of time in prison due to some of the things that I did allegedly just saying that for legal purposes. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, just, I've had those moments, especially in the last, like in the last 30, 60 days, like just the fact that I, you know, I didn't overdose and that I, and I didn't spend a long stint in prison is is mind blowing to me and that, and, and just, um, a lot of the internal growth, like I don't always see it, but when I do, I'm like, Whoa, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a lot of what you do with case management has to do with the justice system, yeah. right? Like you, you have to help the people that are in the clients and treatments set up court appointments, check in with probation officers. Like talk to me a little bit about that piece of your job. So, I mean, my first, the first position I had like in, in treatment or, yeah. the, or recovery was, uh, was, I was a coordinator for, for drug court here in Washington County. And so that was a lot of that coordination, um, now, and you know, other jobs that I've had, it's, it's a lot of, um, coordinating with, with probation, private or adult probation and parole, uh, coordinating with the courts, you know, reporting to the courts or pretrial services. So it, it's a lot of that and, you know, making sure that people, show up well not making sure i can't force anybody but making sure you know that they have the information of when they have court and showing up for those appointments so and i myself navigated the justice system like that's how i got into recovery was you know jail and um i was on probation in the state of utah as well so the old nudge from the judge um i yeah i mean i i guess i would consider it that however i wasn't court ordered to do any kind of treatment which, which is, well, I actually was, they denied me for drug court. They were like, mm -mm. really? Yeah. I look like a soccer mom, but apparently I was a little <laughs> too street for drug court in that year. I don't know. Nice. I, and it was a gift really for me, but I never was offered that. So I just navigated that justice system. And, um, I think my personal experience has helped a lot yeah. as far as jobs go. Yeah, man. Like, isn't it so cool when our mistakes somehow miraculously over time become our strengths? Oh, absolutely. And again, like the mind blowing part about the last six years plus months or whatever, I don't know how to say that accurately, but almost seven years, let's say I like a six and some change, six and change, knocking uh, on seven. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. And, uh, I think that like one of the craziest things for me and not to like to my own horn, but I received a, an award, a public service award from the department of corrections. And it was, there was my friend Lisa and I both received it and it, we were the only civilians there. So everyone else was like, you know, had jumped in front of a, you know, a, a gun or were shot in the line of duty. And, and we received this award and it was just crazy because I, you know, I had successfully completed probation, but I never thought that I would, you know, be seen that way by the department of corrections after that. I just so thought I'd be let, done. Let me, let me slow that down a minute. The department of corrections, Mm -hmm. gave you an award mm -hmm. while at the same time we're giving other officers who had put their lives on the line of basically 
in front of uh, their lives on the line for for duty. Right? Yes. Yeah. That had to have been a super cool experience. It, it was it was uh, nerve wracking. Was and it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I had only been off probation for like maybe two years. And so it was still new and to be in the same room and and not feel judged or whatever. I yeah. mean, and they didn't know that. I don't think the person that that put in for us to win the award did know that he knew that both of us, both Lisa and I had been on probation and um, navigated that. So it was just really, really cool. I felt like um, it was an opportunity for both of us to, you know, speak for us, right? Like to be, to represent that. I think recognition is huge. I've had people that have come on this podcast that have years, decades of, of clean time. I've also had people come on this podcast that have months of clean time. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'm always worried, like I want people leaving this feeling proud, like they shared a message and, and they don't wake up with that vulnerability hangover. One thing a lot of them have said to me that have been in early recovery have said, it helped my recovery so much. Yeah. In that moment when you got that award, what did that do for your recovery? Um, that recognition. Well, again, I was frightened. Everybody had guns but me. But uh, <laughs> it was, you know, it was it was just a testament to what recovery can look like, like what I could gain. Because I never in a million years, even when I had, you know, a year or whatever, did I think that I'd be receiving an award from the Department of Corrections. Like never, yeah. ever. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it, the memory pops up on Facebook and I, and I shameless plug for Facebook, I guess, but, uh, <laughs> bleep that out if you have to. Anyway, I like, it still blows my mind all the time when I, when I put it up on the wall, like, you know, with this new job, like I just, it's, it's still so mind blowing because it, it is a testament to like, that we do recover, that we do reenter society, that we do get better and help people. Yeah. Like when, when we're running and gunning. If somebody would have said to you, Jen Jones, one day you're going to receive this award. No, oh, no. You'd have thought they needed to go to the loony bin, right? No, I was like, I won't, <laughs> I won't take that piece of paper from those cops. Never. You <laughs> right, know? right. All right. So we went down a rabbit hole. Let's jump into this. So, so let's thank you though. That was awesome. And I didn't even know that about you. I got to know something cool and new about you. Sweet. All right. So step one, we talk about, you know what I mean? Like, uh, powerlessness, unmanageability. I try to be respectful to the fellowships and not verbatim. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask it like this. At what point did you realize that you had a problem and you needed help with that problem? Um, I think, I think I, I think I knew I had a problem for a long time. I, I didn't think it was that bad, but, oh, so there's some justification going on there. Oh, it's in some form of denial for sure. Like I wasn't doing that drug or I hadn't been arrested yet or, or whatever, but I know that um, the last time I used, I was on probation and um, I, I knew I didn't want to go back to jail for sure. And I, I was like, hey, I, I think I need help. Like, I think I need help with this. I can't do this by myself. And, um, and yeah, for me, that, looked, that was a 12-step fellowship. But Got you. yeah, I also think in regards to, sorry if I'm taken off, but. No, you're great. In, in regards to, you know, powerlessness, um, in my first round of steps that I worked, like powerlessness was about me, right? Like people, places and things. And, and, um, for some reason when I'm writing, when I do my work writing, uh, I tend to live experiences that like reaffirm what I'm writing about. And, um, and especially like the powerlessness piece, you know, there was tons of people I wanted to get into recovery with me and I tried like hard, yeah. you know, tried and tried and tried. And I also, you know, the, my last use was a powerlessness moment and it was definitely a reservation. I was hanging out with other people that were, were still using. Right. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm strong, you know, I can do this and, and whatever. And, and the reality was that I couldn't and I used, right. And so that's, that was my first like real, um, that's the one that sticks out to me the most in my mind is that I wasn't, I, I am powerless. I could not, not use in that situation at that time. Yeah. And our disease can be cunning and tricky. And oftentimes, right, we're in a place where we got a little bit of recovery underneath our belt and we think, oh, I could totally go, you know, in the quicksand and help pull somebody else out. Yeah. But we got to remember we are powerless. Like, and that that's not an excuse. I always say powerless to me means if I go back and I reuse my addiction gets released all over again. Yeah. That's kind of the definition of the powerlessness to me. Once I have some clean time, then I, I'm not like, I have a choice at that point. Right. It's a so yeah, absolutely. Cool. I totally agree with that statement. All right. So the next one kind of moving through step two, 
At what point did you consider that, that other people that had the same disease that you had were getting well? So in other words, I can remember distinctly in, in my journey going, okay, I know I'm messed up. I know there's parts of me that are broken. I can't keep living like this or I'm going to die or this jail thing is going to keep being a reality for me. And then I thought, I can't be the only person that's, that's had this disease. And I know there are people out there that are getting better. Mm -hmm. Did you have that moment? What'd that look like for you? I think, I think I had that moment like early on, even, you know, before I had used again. Um, so maybe not in that order necessarily, like right in that order. But for me, a lot of it was um, when I was incarcerated here in the Washington County Jail, shameless plug for them, uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, there were these women that brought, brought meetings into the facility. And I honestly, um, you know, my first thought was, no, I didn't believe them because I had seen them places, right? prior to them getting into recovery as well. And, and that, that part was huge for me. I think I mulled that over for, you know, several months and maybe a couple more jail stays, but I was like, if these people can do it, maybe I can do it. Um, and I really was just desperate, like desperate for anything. And, and like I said, I, that last time I used, I was like, Hey, I can't, I can't do this by myself. So, you know, for, for me, that was that, that had kind of carried through was that I, you know, maybe all these people had, you know, had the right idea or at least something. I didn't, I don't think I put that much thought into it. I was just desperate. I love that. And I, I love what you're doing right now because oftentimes when, when we sit down with clients and we talk about steps, they mm -hmm. kind of rolled, they do the eye, the rolling thing. Right. But as you look back and just what you got done sharing with, with us, you can oftentimes look back over your own journey and, and find places in the steps that you've already done these things. Like mm -hmm. you said, like it may not have gone in that order. Maybe step two for you came a little bit before step one, but like you can look back and reflect on and see throughout your path where they've kind of played a role. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. And I think too, like for, if we're like really talking about when I came to believe as, at least as far as a higher power, for me, definitely it was the group first because your fellowship. I, yeah, it was, it was, meetings it yeah. was the people in the meetings it wasn't necessarily you know what what i would say my version of a higher power is now but i i didn't have the capacity to even um wrap my head around like what was taking care of me other than that at the time right and yeah. that's totally cool right yeah because i mean it was it worked for me I'll, oftentimes a lot of us struggle to really separate religion and mm -hmm. spirituality and so we get this this god word right and i think i'm with you with we can agree now having a little bit more clean time, we're at peace with that. And we can yeah. identify with the higher power with God. But for people that are first struggling to separate religion and spirituality, oftentimes it can just be the group, the fellowship. Yeah, absolutely. The body of people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, like I, I had had, um, you know, some life experiences where I was like mad at my version of God. Right. Yeah, like absolutely. I, my, my, when my son passed away, for instance, like mm. I was like, I prayed and prayed and prayed and he didn't live. And so I brought that into my first round of steps. Right. Like I brought that with me. Like, and so the group, the group worked. And I feel like that works for a lot of people, especially if they don't, if they, if they're atheist or they can't wrap their head around that word or they haven't figured out how, or they won't. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So for sure. Did you find within that body of people, that fellowship, that there were people that could um, understand that loss and, and help kind of guide you through it a little bit? Oh, absolutely. I, I feel like I came in with a lot of, you know, self-centeredness and ego or whatever. And I thought like, I'm the only person that's ever lost a child ever. Right. right. And so, um, you know, after a little while, like I found those people, the, you know, the, the me too, cause that's what, that's my favorite part about the recovery community is that there's always someone that's been through it and sometimes it's me right yeah. and 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 at, you know with some work i get to show up that way too but i did find those people and uh, it was amazing i think that's an important reason why to stay involved in the recovery community and to not tuck this thing underneath the rug because there's a stigma to it is somebody may need a, a jen jones somebody right somebody who's a new Newcomer, somebody who's new to the recovery community may need somebody who's gone through or walked through what you've walked through. So it's a big part of my recovery is giving back and helping other people. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's huge. Yeah, for sure. All right. So let's talk about, let's talk about step three. So at what point uh, did you consider that? Oh, I already did that one. At what point did you become ready to let go of control and embrace something greater than yourself? <laughs> you worded that so wrong for me. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I'm completely ready to let go of control 
of all parts of my life. But I do know that, um, and I don't remember specifics about the turning it over part or letting go. I know that, um, I'm trying to think of what the, what was going on. Cause like I said, there's very specific things that were happening when I was writing about these things. And, um, you know, I had to let go of parts of it. I yeah. was, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I was not willing to let go of everything and turn it over. That's a daily else. struggle. Yeah, absolutely. Like, to be honest, that's something that I struggle to this day with, right? Yeah. Like letting go and, and turning it over and just saying, okay, you've got the will, right? Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> take yeah. me the way you're going to take me. That That is a scary, you know what I found with these steps? They get, they get super hard. Yeah. After two, right? It's yeah. like the first one's easy. Like, is your life messed up? Yeah. Has other people had the same messed up life that you haven't been able to come back from it? Yeah. The third one, Let letting go. go of, yeah. of what? Yeah. Are you, no way, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I get it. Well, yeah. And I mean, I, like I said, I, I think I turn over, like I let go of parts and then I take them back and then I let go. But there's a lot of growth in that too. Like knowing what, ultimately when it comes down to it, I know I'm going to be taken care of regardless. I know I'm going to be, now I know I'm going to be okay. But when I was on step three the first time, I, I think I tried to control everything. And again, I, looking back, I think a lot of it was like, you know, other people, like, other people that I had, you know, gotten into recovery with had start, like had gone back out and mm. I could not let go of that. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it, I'm going to ask a question if you're okay answering it. If not, it's okay. Yeah, you don't have to. Yeah, you're good. Do you think part of losing your son played into that? Because oh. anytime, like we have the same loss, like I lost my dad, I lost my brother. And so oftentimes when we build these close relationships and then we've lost somebody and that really hurts. Mm -hmm. We, sh we really cling on and hold to, I'm going to use the word and I hate it, but codependent, right? We become codependent because we don't want to experience that again. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that, yeah, I think that it drives, there's so much fear behind it. And I, and I had lost other people prior to my son dying. And so it was like, everyone's going to die. Yeah. Everyone's going to die. Like a panic, right? Like all a the chaos time. in your all, mind. Yeah. All the time. And you know, I had to do some outside work. Like I went to therapy when I think I had four years because I could not move past that. It was it was getting to the point where it was debilitating. So yeah, I think that that plays a huge part in that, a huge part in that. And thankfully, um, you know, the therapist I got at the at the that I was and I've I've been seeing her for four years. Or I That's think it's fantastic. four years now. You know, a lot of it was like, look, I realize that you're afraid you're going to lose your daughter or your husband, but the truth is, is that you're going to be okay. You have to figure out how, I mean, it's kind of like the codependency stuff, right? You're going to have to figure out how to be okay if they're not okay. And, um, and that took a lot of work, you know, that, and I still take that back sometimes. I still panic and worry and whatever, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. But I do know now that I'm going to be okay. I don't want that to be, to happen necessarily, but well, not necessarily ever, but. Right. But Understandable. I, right. Yeah. But I also know that I could get through that. But oftentimes that's, that's a reservation that we keep in our mind, right? Mm -hmm. Like I know I, I love my mom. I love, you know, Mandy, these close relationships in my life. Um, I've had to, like you're talking about, I've had to come to the point where there's no excuse. Like the, if I lose those people, I have to find a way to be able to cope and be able to manage th that loss without turning back to coping with drugs. Oh, definitely. Heroin is not an okay way to cope with a loss. No, I did that with my son passing away. Do you yeah. mind? I, we got a minute and a left minute and a half left here before the first segment's up. What was kind of the circumstances around losing your son? Um, so my son, he, when he was about a year old, his kidneys had failed and um, he was diagnosed with a really rare genetic disorder. Like I think he was the 167th case in the developed countries since 1965 or something. Oh, wow. So it was a really rare uh, disorder and long story short, it had caused it it generally caused children to develop Wilms tumors in their kidneys. And so his kidneys weren't functioning and they had to remove them because they didn't want to get cancer. And it's a form of cancer that doesn't respond to mm. treatment. And so they, when they removed his kidneys, they didn't clamp one of the art, the main arteries that goes into your kidneys and he, bl and he bled internally. Man. So it was, you know, it was human error. Yeah. Um, that had to be really hard though. It, yeah, it was for sure. Yeah. Definitely the hardest thing I've done. Yeah. Thank you so much that I appreciate your vulnerability. Oh, you're welcome. 
So we're winding down here. We got about thirty seconds left in episode in uh, episode fifty four, part two. Jen's going to talk to us about step four. We're going to dive into understanding step four, the benefits of it. Step four is a scary step. I mean, I think so. Prior it's to doing it, it's an action step, right? For, oh, there's for some, sure. Yeah. There's some stuff you got to do. Yeah, yeah. Lots of stuff you have to do. So we'll get that after this uh, little thirty second uh, infomercial. Commercial infomercial. What is it, Sean? 30 second break where our sponsor tells you about steps recovery centers. You are listening to we do recover with Jared Miller and co-hosted by Dr. Terry Sellers. We'll be right back after this short break with more of we do recover with Jared Miller sponsored by steps recovery center and the Hilton garden Inn. I'm Desmond Lomax, one of the clinical executives here at Steps Recovery, and once you become of the Steps family, you're just a part of the Steps family. A lot of us have overcome substances, overcome addiction, and now we're able to help other people. Second of all, we're also going to help you in a way where you can afford to be helped. Third of all, we're going to give you the same quality that many organizations are charging two to three times, and it's more about you than it is about our organization. We welcome you back to We Do Recover with Jared Miller, co-hosted by Dr. Terry Sellers. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. And now with part two of our podcast, Jared Miller and Dr. Terry Sellers. All right, we're back from the little break. Thank you so much for uh, continuing to watch. So episode 54, part two is brought to you by the Hilton Garden Inn. It's always sunny and bright at the Hilton Garden Inn. If you are wanting to get just get away Come enjoy some warm weather. It's not a thousand degrees anymore, right, Jen? Yeah, it's not. It's lovely. And Southern Utah is beautiful this time of year. Gorgeous. Like you're, you got a cardigan. Is that what that's called, right? Yes. A cardigan on because it's it's actually cooled down here. And it's freezing inside everywhere you go. So yeah. <laughs> so if you're wanting to schedule a trip to Southern Utah, check out the Hilton Garden Inn. Just give them a Google search. Just type in Hilton Garden Inn, St. George, Utah. They really do. They have amazing amenities. I know every week we talk about the pool. It's just, it's a fantastic place for you to, to land and experience Southern Utah. For those of you that are out of state, we are right by a ton of really cool national parks. we got Zions National Park, Snow Canyon. Am I missing any others that are in our backyard, Jen? Bryce isn't that far. Yeah, yeah. So it's an amazing place to come visit. Definitely uh, come check it out. Sweet. So we built up to step four. Okay. And like I said before the break, in my opinion, step four is one of the tougher steps because it actually requires some internal work. Yeah, I would say that. So talk to us about step four. Well, I, I would like to you know start by saying it's, it's a lot scarier prior to doing it than after doing it. At least it was for me. Isn't that so true about so many things? So all the things, really. Oh, yeah. I mean, everything. Yeah. We, we, the buildup, the fear that we, you know, what is this going to look like? The unknown. For yeah. sure. We make this mount, this huge mountain out of a molehill. Right? right. Right. Did I say that right or did I say that backwards? I don't know. <laughs> it works for me. I can translate. It's fine. Uh, I appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I tracked it. So it's, it's scarier after you've done it. Yeah. And I think like I paused, obviously, before I started writing on it, I like I paused because it I just heard, right? Like I just heard things. People mm -hmm. were like, oh, and it took me forever and, you know, this and that and whatever. And it brought up all this stuff for me. I'm grateful that um, that when I was moving into step four, this the sponsor I had at the time, we had developed a relationship to where you know she knew almost everything. The stories have been told, and so when I finally sat down and started writing, it wasn't so bad. It does bring up stuff, right? Like there's stuff, um, yeah. You know, you're doing an inventory of the things you've done, um, and I think that that can be, you know, bring up a lot of shame and guilt, and um, you know, sadness. And especially if there's things in there, you know, about abuse or whatever, like obviously you're, you're dragging up a bunch of stuff that happened to you or done by you. Right. Absolutely. And you talked about what it talks about in step five, where it's super important that to, to, when you get ready for step five, to be able to share your inventory from step four, to have somebody you trust, have somebody that you feel comfortable with, somebody that you know is going to keep your anonymity, right? That, that, that's a huge piece because in order to get real deep and to get real vulnerable, you've got to, you got to have that safety net. You got to feel comfortable with somebody. Absolutely. That's cool that you had that. Yeah, and I also, I mean, I had an experience when you know after I had worked um, some steps, I was asked to come in and have somebody read a, a step four to me that I didn't know. Never met her. Never. I haven't seen her since. Wow. Like, and so, um, 
you know, and it says, it says in everyone's literature, like it doesn't have to be your sponsor. It just has to be somebody that you trust or whatever. Right. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, her secrets are safe with me. I've yeah. never, I haven't seen her since, you Yourself, know, self God and another person and another person. Yeah. Right. And, and it was, it was wild. She was exceptionally vulnerable and I was like, all right, you know, yeah, that's brave on a whole different level. So brave. Yeah. It was so brave. Yeah. Yeah. It was wild. Anyway. But also with step four though, I have a question because you, you said the things that you've done and I know that, that that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. Also, um, I know when I did uh, sec, uh, step four, my second time, different sponsor, um, he asked me to write down things that I, that I wasn't really okay with that had happened in my past. Yeah. Right. And so like in my first one, I, I wrote down all the, like you said, the stuff that I kind of felt guilty for and that, that I had, but the second one, I also wrote down things like my dad passing away. Yeah. And like, you know, things that weren't really in, in my control, but had affected me. Yeah, definitely. I think, so the way that I did a step, like, and obviously there's different ways to do it, but the way that I did it, you know, was outlined with questions mm -hmm. and some of them were very specific to like sexual abuse that had happened to me yep. and, you know, things like, like you said, that were traumatic and, um, you know, all, and like I said, it just brings up a, lo a lot of stuff. And so those are the things that, I mean, they're painful because like I spent, you know, I, like when I, when I came in recovery, it was 35. And so, I, you know, probably from 18 to 35, I spent all that time covering up those feelings. And so it was a lot, it was a lot to process just writing about it, you know? And I think the, the hardest part of step four, the way that I did it with my sponsor, mm -hmm. um, it starts out with resentments and, um, when I started, it was, it's so funny because I, I remember this, like it was yesterday, I started writing on a resentment and it just so happened to be with, I'll be vague just in case, like a family member, let's say. And yeah. I wrote this family member's name down and just was sobbing. And then the guy that sprayed our house for bugs was in recovery too. And he came around the corner at my house and he's like, dude, what are you doing? And I'm like, <laughs> I just started writing on this resentment and it was difficult. It was difficult. Um, and for me, that was like the hardest part that that and then the end which we'll get to was the hardest part for me in step yeah. four was just you know first of all looking at the fact that most of my resentments are me yep. it's mine right it's not the other person um some of it some of my resentments are against people that were abusive and i don't have a part in that right which is the important part of that yeah what you saying that triggered something in my brain though so did you, and i'm just curious if you did this too so did you do the columns no like different columns no i did it in a guide so the, it okay. was guided the yeah, writing yeah, was with, yeah oh, so yep. it was questions and so Better, the resentments yeah. was first right and it that part was just so heart-wrenching to me um and some of it's just again history and things that have happened to me and um and of course i immediately thought i had a part in that you know like yeah i, I had um a situation where i was sexually assaulted and i was like oh that was my fault for putting myself in it you know or whatever Got you. Which is why you do like I did it. You do it with a sponsor because then they're like, "Hey, check it out, bro. You you do not have a part in that." Right. Yeah. So that was not something that you get to to take accountability. No, I'm for. not gonna. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't shock me, but I was on the other end of that spectrum. So I I would, you know, when I wrote down when I was asked my part in things mm -hmm. and got to look at my part in things. I felt like I was in court and I was pleading my case. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, well, hold on a minute. Let me this and this and this and yeah. right like. I all of a sudden turned into the best attorney in the world, oh my you know, and was, was pleading my case. And, and so that was on mine too. Like there are people, there were people that I wrote about that were like, and they, you know, they, they gossiped about me and ba 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 And not until later, you know, going over it, I was like, oh, well I did that too. Right. 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 But I, I mean, and I think that's part of, that's the, that's really the humility piece in step four. And that, that's for me, honestly, doing the step five with the sponsor and, and looking at the inventory, mm -hmm. that's where a true shift happened in me. Like when I started looking for my account to be the, the, the pieces that I got to be accountable for, mm -hmm. I went from the victim to realizing, okay, that's heavy and that hurts and right. I don't like looking at that but I can change my future if I understand how I play a role in that event happening. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you that, talk about a shift. Yeah. And that's, I, that's, the, I mean, really like the, the, one of the spiritual principles in step four is humility, right? Which humility doesn't mean what everybody thinks it means. Just like surrender in a program doesn't mean what people think it means. And 
And for me, that was huge. Like I'm no better than, and I'm no less than. Yeah. I'm just human. Let's right. Get, let's get, if you don't mind, we're going to kind of go off topic for a sec, but let's do it. I found that interesting that you say that. So what does surrender mean to you? Um, in regards to the program, yeah, like absolutely. it means, you know, surrendering to the program. It means, you know, dive in with both feet or head first, whatever you want to do, right, but, all in. but go all in, yeah. you know? And, um, and I, you know, I made that, I didn't make that decision right away either. It's like turning it over, right? Like I surrender <laughs> right. and then I was like, no, nah, and then I'd surrender. But really I, I did surrender by continuing to work the steps. That's a surrender, you know, to, to that program in right. particular. So, right. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So my idea of surrender, how I've kind of come to understand it is, uh, accepting being okay with, Yeah. you know, like when they talk about surrender to me, it was like for a long time, I didn't want to be an addict. I didn't want to identify that way. I thought that I could go back to the land of the normies and be the guy that had a, you know, a beer on the weekend sitting around barbecuing and, and, you know, I wouldn't have a problem with pain pills that they were ever prescribed to me again. Right. Like, and so surrender to me, mean the way I took it was accepting that, yeah, this is a disease and I, I am one of the 10% of people that are walking around the habit. I would agree with that too. Yeah. Yeah, That's absolutely. Cool. What was the other piece that you were talking about? Uh, surrender. Humility. 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 Talking about what I that think, looks like for you. Well, I mean, I think like, you know, before recovery, like humility to me meant, um, you know, shame, like being shamed or being knocked, knocked down a peg or yeah, yeah. knocked or, off your high horse yes, or, so or whatever, you know? And I think that like, like I said, step four for me was pivotal. Like, um, and hopefully we don't jump to the, the end part that is involved in that, but you know, I had done all these things. Right. And I looked at my part and sometimes, and you, like you said, it's not, it's not easy to look at that. No. Um, but it was also really good to look at some of the things and realize that I didn't do anything in that situation. That's just stuff that happened to me. Right. It's not stuff that I instigated or brought on myself, you yeah. know, and, and I'm, and I'm just human. And granted, I didn't adopt that all the way, but it did certainly help push me in that direction. It's a progressive thing. Yeah, you got to work on it. It's not like, you know, it's like riding a bike. You're not going to jump on a bike when you've never rode one before and been, you know, be BMX rider. Well, no. Yeah. It's something you got to work on for sure. Well, yeah, and I don't think I really internalized the, the work that I did in, in the steps until like, you know, two later. I was like, oh, yeah, that's what that means, you know. So, <laughs> right, right. You, and then continue to do so with other women that I walk through the steps, you know. Yeah, like, absolutely. It's different that way. So, so humility to me, if, if so, you know, to kind of put it from my understanding, would be to get rid of the self obsession, mm -hmm. to think of other people outside of myself. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like oftentimes I, the number one thing with this, this whole disease is a big factor is self-obsession. Like today I get to think of how other people are affected and I try to be as respectful as possible. And I try to really think, especially when I'm working with other clients or when I'm working, you know what I mean? Um, with sponsees, what's important to this person right right now to me, that's what humility is yeah. getting outside of myself. Yeah. I love it. All right. What more on step four do you want to go over? So you've talked about resentments. Yeah. What about relationships? What'd that look like for you in your step four? It was, it was painful. Yeah. <laughs> it was painful to look at it and painful to look at my role in those relationships. Again, like that's really what step four was for me was like looking at, you know, the scales and getting them even like I, um, I definitely was not, uh, healthy for, that whole time, you know, from yeah. birth to 35, um, and probably not until years later, but, but the, you know, things that I had done in relationships, the relationships I chose, you didn't um, get the perfect relationship guide. I did not. Oh man. I missed that too. I did not. <laughs> um, and you know, thankfully a lot of people in my life were willing to like, you know, wade that storm, wade through that storm, yeah. um, or wait it out. I'm not sure. Or they're just, you know, not smart, but they, <laughs> you know, I'm just kidding. Shout out Jones. Um, but like that was, it was painful to see how I showed up in relationships. It was painful to see like, um, to really look at relationships that I thought were good and that they weren't healthy. Yeah. It was difficult. I think for the, sure. The kind of, you don't know what you don't know. Right. Yeah. You think, oh yeah, this is great. It's fantastic. And then you get the reality kind of check and go, oh man. Yeah. The writing process is really weird that way for sure. Yeah. It definitely is. So. Let's take a look at, um, we talked about kind of the self-obsession and self-centeredness. Mm -hmm. What about 
So, okay. I'm drawing a blank here. When you did your step four, mm -hmm. did you basically, once you did it, did you wait for a while before you talked to a sponsor about it? Before I talked to it or did it step well, five? Well, because I guess what I'm getting at, yeah, step five, because what I'm getting at is just as hard as it is to write an inventory mm -hmm. and take a look at ourselves, it can be equally as hard to then come to the conclusion that I have to tell somebody else this thing. Yeah. Is that difficult for you? I, I think the writing part was harder. That's what really? I was saying. Like I, there was so much buildup because I'd heard it's so difficult and blah, 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 and whatever. And no, nobody told me that the resentments piece was going to be the hardest for me. Everybody was like just writing out about how you harmed other people was the part. Right. Hmm. And for me, it was the resentments. And then, um, and I had already told my sponsor 90% of what was in there in just in conversation. Right. Right. Before you even got to the step before I even got to it. So for me, like it wasn't, it, I wasn't scared to read it off. Now there were things, right? Like for instance, um, the way I did it, there's a question that says like, did you, is there anything you left out? Right. Yeah. And there was something I left out and I totally left it out. I did not on purpose. I, it was intentional. Got you. Um, my level of self honesty, even at that time, wasn't, I wasn't there yet. What had happened was I had used, um, I had like after two months in recovery, I had used and I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell anyone. And so, and I didn't even tell her. Right. And I didn't you tell left her. that out of this. Step I left four it empire. out. I left it out like for all the rest of them. Um, <clears throat> I had a situation come up where I, where I got honest about it later, about a year later. So, and I did get honest and I got honest at the group level as well. But, and, and, you know, my life, um, that I had used two months after that. So my clean date had to change, but what did that do for you within that year period? Did that eat at you? Was it, it was a mess. It was a mess, man. Like I, so I was asked to share at a couple of places and I, I had to like really like, um, dance because I was like, okay, that's not, I can't say that. And so I like, oh. I wasn't. So it put a big old block in your. Yeah. Mental. I didn't feel authentic. And when, you know, when I did, when I did finally like come clean about it, it was, there was so much relief in that. That was the one thing that was the only thing I hadn't said out loud. Yeah. Um, and so that was, that was really fantastic. The, the hard, the, the hardest, the absolute hardest part about step four for me was writing out my assets. So I was asked to write my assets and goals. And, um, why do you think that was the hardest for you? I, I mean, I think at the time I had maybe somewhere between nine months and, and a year. And, mm -hmm. um, I didn't think I had any assets and I didn't know that I had I guess I didn't, you know, believe that I had anything to offer. It was, it was really difficult. And to even like write on paper goals was just too much for me. I sobbed at that part, not the sexual abuse, not my son dying, not things that happened to me in childhood, that part. Do you think maybe part of that is the fear of like believing if it was possible with the goals. In other words, I, I know here's what I see a lot of, especially like in the higher levels of treatment, the RTC, right? Is people struggle to really believe that things are achievable for them because they've lived in survival mode for so long. Yeah. Does that make sense that it's like, they don't even, so I do an assignment called best future self, where basically I, I ask them, take a look at yourself in a year from now. What does it look like? The best version of yourself. If, if you're able to overcome this thing, you know what I mean? And, and get life back on kind of back on track. And then five years and 10 years, you get the idea. And I'm telling you, that's one of the assignments that's the hardest for people to do. Yeah. The assets part and that for sure. And I'll tell you what they were. Cause I know what they are. Yeah. Um, I love it. Let's get it. Like this is my version of like, you know, reaching for the stars at the time. One was to get off paper. Like that was my goal. Get off, yeah, probation. Get off probation. Um, and which by the way, I want to be very clear was not difficult. <laughs> my probation because i was i didn't use and i was going to meetings and it was easy i right. think i tested twice once was that positive right like that's it that was it i didn't have an ankle monitor nobody told me to go to treatment it was the easiest thing but that was my goal i'm gonna get off probation great goal um i think the the one-year goal that was my one-year goal my five-year goal was i think i wanted to go back to school at the time um and then my other five-year goal was to like work with probation so the odd thing about going back to that is that, I mean, I didn't technically like work for adult probation parole, but I got the opportunity to work closely with them. And right. then you, that you get to collaborate with them on just about an everyday basis. Yeah. I mean, and obviously I got a probation, but, but right. like, that's the, that's all my mind could wrap around was that. 
like go back to school for something, I think is what it says. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And yeah. then like yeah. D, 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 but work with probation was definitely on there. It was bizarre that it, I mean, not bizarre, but it played out, you know, and it's amazing, but I did not know I had anything to offer the world. The assets part was definitely difficult. Is that why you got the emotional reaction that you got out of it? Out of what? Writing your goals. Like I find it interesting. You, you say you, you literally said talking about the sexual abuse and talking about some of the things that you had experienced wasn't as hard and didn't get as an emotional response out of you. Maybe a little bit of the resentments, but really writing those future goals. Like why, what was the emotion? What was the, was it fear? What was I'm, it? I'm sure it's like, like, honestly, the, the stuff, that other stuff had happened to me. And I mean, I didn't do that, the, the real work on those things until later in therapy, but, um, and you know, in discussion, but really it was just that I, I didn't, I could not imagine mm -hmm. that. And I think a lot of it was just that, like I had, I felt like I had wasted so many years um, you know, using, I stayed at home with my kids when I wasn't using and, you know, whatever that I didn't feel like I had any skills and that I couldn't achieve those skills. And so it was just really difficult, really difficult. I find that extremely fascinating because we've had, we've had different guests on and one of the guests, Todd Sylvester, he, he's a counselor, but he doesn't call himself a counselor. He calls himself a belief coach. Mm -hmm. And he said that basically kind of in his, uh, pedagogy or right. His, the way that's he a, looks at that's it. That's a $10 word. Right. Jared. Yeah. Yeah. I know. In his uh, therapeutic approach, yes. he believes that the, the biggest thing to overcome with clients is restructuring their belief system and getting them to believe that, that a life different than the life that they've been living is possible. Right. So I find that super fascinating. I think that's, yeah. What did that do for you? What? Well, obviously it worked because you got off paper. Well, I did. And you, Goal in one. some, way shape or form work with adult probation and parole yeah i think i mean i think that like i said there's uh, the, there was at that time i hadn't done any work on my belief system or or you know whatever i've done parts work and inner child work and whatever and i didn't i had never really looked at what happened to me in fact i it took like a year of therapy for me to for my therapist finally said like do you realize you've experienced trauma you know, and so I, it was just so hard for me to do that. Plus I like, I really started using as an adult, like I hadn't right. even done heroin until I, can I say heroin? Yeah. Uh, until I was thir I don't know why that, why that's it. <laughs> um, until I was 30, you know? Yeah. And so, and then I, and then I be, got into recovery when I was 35. And so like, I, I, in my mind was a middle-aged lady that was like on the downward slope of her life, you know? And yeah, so no, it was, I totally get it. It, and it, it was just that, that self doubt and some of the things that I, you know, that, that I attached, that was my core belief. I'm always wrong. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not good enough, whatever. And so it was really hard to work through that. It took a lot of time to work through that. You know, another, I appreciate you sharing this. This is, I love this right here. So one thing that I've really identified with a lot of clients working with a diverse number of people, Oftentimes when people have a sense of self that they can return to, like you said, you didn't start using until you were 30. Well, using heroin specifically, oh, okay. not, not using. But you, but would you agree that you had some former sense of who you were as a person mm -hmm. prior to your substance abuse? Yeah. I like mean, you I had was, a pretty good sense of self. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, you're a strong personality. You don't. I had a strong personality prior to using it. Yes. <laughs> right, right. So you had something kind of to yeah. return back to. I guess what I'm getting at is I find it extremely hard. Like you hear people that, that really started abusing heavy drugs at age 12, 14. Right. And it's like, man, what are they, what memory, and they've been using for a decade or two. And it's right. like, what memories or what sense of self are they able to return to? Right. Does that make sense? I guess you could just get to, I mean, I, I'm honestly externally probably similar. Like I've always been kind of feisty mouthy, you know, or yeah. whatever, but I, the way I interact with the world is completely different. Right. And so, they get to do self-discovery. They yeah, get to learn. It's complete self-discovery. But I believe that I did that as well because I don't know that I ever knew. Oh yeah. You definitely change. Yeah. Right. But you return to a little bit of, or some of, well, yeah, a little I was, version. I'm of still the yourself. parent of my children, right. which was like my right. biggest role. And I, you know, returned to being my husband's wife and you know, things like that, that I identified with or that I held close to me, um, for sure. Absolutely. And plus I was a little, like, I was a little bit older. So it was, I had all these other experiences that weren't, you know, around just using specific. Yeah. That's yeah. what you're saying, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Definitely. So Jen, you're a powerhouse and I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge. Like when I think of people that are strong in the steps and strong in the fellowship, you're, you're in my like top five. Oh, thank for you. For sure. Thank you. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. I genuinely appreciate you coming on and, and, and yeah, just sharing your experience, strength and hope with us. Thank you. I got one last question for you to take us out. Okay. What advice would you give someone who is fearful of, of starting steps? The steps, the steps or, or just step four? Let's go specifically step four. Okay, I'll go back to the steps because you asked that. So, um, you got a minute to win it. Girl. Okay, well, I would just say that, like, what you know, what do you have to lose? It goes back to that surrender. Um, I, I could not, I can't sum up in a minute and two seconds the relief that I got from working all 12 steps. I'm currently on another round of steps for that reason, right? Like, there's relief in it. And, um, and I definitely know myself better. Mm. I know what I want, kind of. I know what I, what I won't accept at least. Um, I know where to draw my boundaries and, um, and honestly, like my relationship with my daughter and my husband and the people that I've, um, gained along the way, I w I would never give up. And so for me working, like working through some of that stuff and then, you know, obviously some outside help, like I, I can't even believe I show up the way I do today. I can't, I don't even like, I don't even know how to wrap that up. Yeah. But I know that I grieved my son's death in the steps and I grieved some of the things that happened to me. So it was definitely worth it. You're amazing. Thank you for being such a great example. Thank you. I really Thank appreciate you. you. All right, guys. So join us next week for episode 55. It's been fantastic. Please like this, comment, and share. Thank you for joining us today on We Do Recover with Jared Miller. Help us spread our message of hope. Like, comment, and share. If you have any topics or ideas for future shows, please share that on our Facebook page. That Facebook page is We Do Recover with Jared Miller. If you or a loved one needs help, please reach out to us. Again, thank you for listening. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. This has been a production from A Podcast Studio.